Welcome to the fifth lecture of Dynamics of Work and Energy of Particles. Let's see if I get to that. Okay. This is basically a continuation of the fourth lecture. And we talked about having angular momentum versus applied torque for several particles, angular momentum and impulse, and an example. And I promised all that in the last lecture, but didn't quite uh, deliver it. And this is what we're going to be talking about this time. Now, one thing you want to watch out about is, is the fact that, that the derivations look complicated, but they're not. Uh, the, the biggest complication is the good old summation sign in all of this. If you write them out for yourself, you'll see that they're not really that bad. And again, the best way for you to learn this is to try it out yourself. Um, watching it is one thing, but doing it is entirely another. This is really a multiple, multi-particle analog of single particle theory. So all of the single particle stuff that we've done already is really applicable to multiple particles. And the results are exactly the same. It's just the complicating factor is the fact that we're using several particles rather than just one. So, as an example, maybe we might take a look at um, manipulator, manipulator arm dynamics. And this is in a, a horizontal plane, for example. All right. So, we don't have to worry about gravity here particularly. But we do have two masses, M and M here. And they happen to both be the same mass. All right. All right. So, we have the same masses there. And what we're looking for is how it behaves. The equations that would describe this motion are complex. And even without, without linearization, you can imagine here already that the motion of this particular mass, well, that's going to be nonlinear. And the motion of this second mass with regard to the first mass, that's nonlinear as well. And it turns out that the motion of this second mass with respect, with respect to a fixed coordinate system is going to be especially nonlinear. Okay. And if we use linearization, it's really impractical for uh, robotics because very often um, when we're talking about using linearization, we're talking about saying that cosine of theta, well, we'll treat that just as one, and sine theta, that's approximately theta. But for robotics, say, maybe this, this value of theta is 45 degrees, maybe it's zero, maybe it's 90. Um, we need to have the motion of this arm over, over long distances. And in these situations, the linearization just won't work. So in these kinds of cases, we'd have to do some sort of um, uh, online analysis. Um, you might code this up in Fortran or C or something to, to run concurrent analysis as you're running the system, or to do some sort of analysis prior that, you know, via Mathematica or something along those lines. Okay, so let's get to it. Um, for a single particle, we had the kinetic energy is equal to 1 half m times v dot v. And for several particles, however, we'll define the, just the, the total kinetic energy is just a sum of the, the corresponding kinetic energies because this is a scalar quantity after all. And, so, and where these, each of these, each of these is defined by the ith mass and its velocity. So mi vi dot vi with the one half in here, of course. Now, the, another way to look at it is, is we can split up the kinetic energy in terms of the motion of the center of mass here. Where this is, notice this is the total mass here, the m. We have the velocity of the center of mass squared, or in other words, v, this is actually vc dot vc, right? And then we have mi, rho dot i, rho dot i, uh, as written here as well, okay? So you can write it out in terms of the motion of the center of mass and motion of the ith particle relative to the center of mass, where this, this rho dot i is with respect to the CG, the center of gravity or center of mass. All right, so this also means a center of mass. It's unfortunate, but people will write center of gravity and center of mass and intend to mean the same things, and they aren't always the same thing. Potential energy and the work done by forces applied to each of the particles add up in a similar way. So if we were to write uh, each particle has a potential energy V sub i, 
the total potential energy is just given by a summation of that. Similarly, if we do work on each of the particles, it should be an equal sign here, the work on each of the particles is as W sub I, and that's equal to F sub I dot DR sub I. Notice that we're not including we're not including the internal forces here. It's only the external forces, and that's generally true. Uh, we don't have work done by the internal forces on each of these particles. The work here, the total work, is a summation of each of the each of the bits of work. All right, and where the individual contributions of the internal forces are canceling out is when we take this summation. From before, we had Newton's second law for a group of particles, if you remember. So, and this is again, we're assuming that then mi dot is equal to zero, right? So we have mass times acceleration, r sub i double dot is equal to the sum of the forces, uh, external forces on, on the ice particle, right? And if we add everything up for all of the particles in the group, this is the equation we'd have. And if we integrate this with respect to time, then what we'd end up with is we'd say we'd have a total impulse by all external forces. We call that F hat with an underbar for a lack of having a better term. And then, so this is the, all the impulses on all the particles, right, by the, all the external forces. And then this is the total linear, linear momentum at the end of a time period, so at time t equals t2. And then we subtract off the total linear momentum at the beginning of the time period, t is equal to t1. The, th the interesting thing about this is, is that the total linear momentum is given by the total mass of the particle times the velocity of the mass center, right? So we're just looking at the, the total mass of, the, of the, all the particles together and then looking at how that, how the velocity of our mass center changes. That is related back to the impulses put on each of the particles over that period of time. If you remember from before, we had the angular momentum is equal to right, rho, dot, rho cross P, where rho is our moment arm, and then of course P is our momentum, our linear momentum. Okay, and in this case, so if we replace the momentum by its definition, that's M R dot, and then our then we would use our angular momentum in sort of the equation for Newton's second law about a particular point, B. As long as B is a fixed point, this, this moment about B is equal to the time derivative of the angular momentum about B. And if B is moving, then we have to have a correction there. Um, the angular momentum is still fine, but we still have to worry about this, this other term. Remember in the previous notes we wrote V sub B. V sub B and R sub B dot is the same thing. This is a figure that we, we might use here, where we have maybe the mass center, and we'll have a fixed point O here, all right? And we have an ith particle out of many, many particles. And, and for clarity's sake, we're going to write only the ith particle. So this particular particle here is just the ith particle. It has a mass m sub i, has a velocity r sub i dot. Its position is given from a fixed point O, say, by r sub i, right? And then we have uh, the mass center, perhaps, okay? And we'll say that the, the, the vector to the mass center, that's r sub c, and we have a reference point, r sub b, to, uh, that defines a vector to that point. Perhaps the reference point is moving, and the v velocity of that particular point is r sub b dot, Maybe the mass center is moving as well. That's r sub c dot. It's just the time derivative of these two vectors, isn't it? So what about all these other vectors? Well, we could have r sub ci from the mass center to the ith point. Okay, so r from c to i is r sub ci. From b to i, well, that's r sub bi. And this vector here, it's not labeled. From point b to point c is r c b. For a system of n particles with angular momentum of, say, h, the ith particle has an angular momentum of h bi, 
Okay, so we could just put I's on all this, rho I, P I, or rho I, M I, R I dot. Okay, then if it's move, having a, about a moving reference point B, then we might write H B is equal to the summation of H sub B I. It's equal to the summation of, we'll substitute in here, okay, R sub B I. So our moment arm here, we might have previously written rho sub i, but now we're going to write r sub bi to go from point b to our mass, crossed with mi r sub i dot. That's our linear momentum. And if we take the time derivative of this, then that's equal to the time derivative of this product. And in other words, we have the summation here, r sub bi dot, notice the dot there, and then cross product with m sub i r sub i dot, plus the summation of r sub bi crossed with m i r sub i double dot. Now, now it actually turns out that we can expand this out and expand some of these terms out to make things a little more simple. If we look at r sub bi, well, we can go through c and say that all right, r sub bi is r sub bc plus r sub ci. If we look back at the figure, we can see that. r sub bi, well r sub bi goes from b to point i. Or we can go from b to the mass center, r sub cb, to then r sub ci. Right? I should say this is really r sub bc, isn't it? Excuse me. So r sub, from b to c is r bc, so r bc, and then r ci. Takes us to the same point from point b. So, if we take the time derivative of that, then, then we just take the time derivative of each of these vectors. So, r, r sub bi, that's equal to r sub bc plus r sub ci. So, so then, r dot sub bi is equal to r dot bc plus r dot ci. And r sub i is equal to r sub c plus r sub ci. And that means that r sub i dot is equal to r sub c dot plus r sub ci dot. For the ith particle, Newton's second law says that m i r i double dot is equal to f i. So, this term above, number two, let me flip back up and show you, this term here, right, if we substitute in then, this Newton's second law says that this second term, m sub i, r sub i, double dot, that's equal to f sub i. So we're going to replace this with f sub i. So if we substitute three, equations three and four into equation one, notice that we have r sub b i, well we can put that in here, we have r sub bi over here as well, right? We can substitute that in there. And we have r sub, um, r sub i double dot. Well, we've taken care of that part. And what about, if we look back at equation one, we have r sub i dot, don't we? And we have r sub bi dot. We have those two terms taken care of as well. So here is our r sub bi dot. We've substituted in for that. And then we have here r sub c plus r sub ci. That was originally r sub i dot, right? And if we rearrange, what we can do is actually we can say that this is r sub bc dot cross product with mi r sub c dot. And then um, r sub ci dot cross product with mi r sub c dot. And then uh, r sub bc dot m sub i r sub ci dot and then r sub ci dot cross with mi r sub ci dot. And this is what we've got here, uh, these three terms, or four terms, I should say. So first, r sub bc dot cross with mi r sub c dot, okay, and then r sub ci dot cross with mi r sub c dot. Notice that in this particular term, we have the same term cross product with its, each other. We can write m sub i r sub ci dot cross r sub ci dot. That's going to be zero, isn't it? So at least we got rid of something out of all this. And this, this term, r sub bc cross m sub i r sub ci, well, this isn't something else we're going to have to look at. We can't forget this last term, and there it is, there at the very last. Okay? So if we look at number two, first off, r sub ci dot cross m i r sub c, let's see what we can, if we can write this any simpler or not. r sub ci dot, well, if we put m sub i over here, you notice that, in fact, what we've got is we've got this, right, m sub i, r 
sub C i dot, that's a summation, and whatever we get out of that summation, then it's a cross product with R sub C, because this doesn't have anything to do with this summation. Well, you remember that from a mass center, that M sub I R sub C i, the mass center is defined by this equation. That's going to be equal to zero, right? So what you do is you're going from the mass center out to each of these particles, M sub I, and this is R sub I, and we, we add up the distances to each of these particles and multiply that against their masses, and sure enough, this is the R sub C I that tells us where this is at is going to be at the mass center, right? Because this is R sub C I, isn't it? This is R sub C I. Cj for some of the m sub j, the other particles say. This is defined with this because it's at the mass center. So if we take a time derivative of both sides, well, then we get a derivative here, and it's still zero. So this term is actually turned out to be zero. We get zero crossed with r sub c dot, and that has to be equal to zero. So if we go back, then this term as well turns out to be zero. Okay. The third term. Well, we're saying that the third term is zero as well. Why? Hmm. Well, if you look here, we see that we've got that term right there. We're saying that the summation of i from 1 to n of m i r sub c i dot, and we had a, a cross here and leading it, r b c. Well, this term has to be zero for exactly the same reasons we had before. So that whole term turns out to be zero. All that we have left are basically all that we have left is basically this first term, isn't it? We're left with this first term that we had, r sub bc dot, cross with mi r sub i dot, plus this, this moment term. So h sub b dot, well, that's equal to the summation from i of 1 to n of r dot bc, cross product with mi r sub i dot, plus, and I've used a script m here for uh, about b, to, to as a definition for this term here. So if, in other words, what we're saying is if we take MBI, that should be, if the script M sub B is defined as a summation of the applied um, moments about point B on each of the particles, right, for your entire system, then this overall moment applied to the entire system is equal to the angular rate of a the rate change with respect to time of the angular momentum about b, and we're subtracting off this other term. We have where maybe b is moving with respect to the center of mass, cross product with the mass of each of the particles times its respective uh, velocity. And in other words, this is the linear momentum of each of these particles, and this is like a correction term. So this is for when, when b is moving. Okay, and so that represents some sort of correction for when it's moving. Okay, if B is fixed, we might call it the fixed point O, say, and so we'll replace B with O, and instead of having a B here, we go with, with O, and so the, the moment, the total moment about uh, everything is equal to the rate change in time of the angular momentum, and this should be a script. Script M. Sorry about that. All right, so script M should sub zero is equal to H dot sub O. If B is the same point as the point C at the center of mass, then it turns out that this particular term, our correction factor, go back and look at the correction factor here. This particular term, R from B to C, well, this R B C has to be equal to zero. So that means that R dot B C is equal to zero. So this correction term is equal to zero as well. So if you, if you define your point B, as it were, at the center of mass, then no matter what you do, then this R dot BC is equal to zero, so we don't have to worry about a correction again. Even if point C is moving, however much, okay, even if point C is moving, okay, so then we have the moment about C is equal to the time derivative of the angular momentum about C. So, in other words, if you're going to be actually solving the, uh, dynamics problems, 
picking a fixed point or picking a center of mass are good choices if you can make them for solving dynamics problems. Because a lot of times you do have a choice as to where you actually find the moment and find the angular momentum, uh, which point you use for these kinds of calculations. And in this case, of course, in, to avoid having that correction, then you have O and C as, as, as pretty good choices. Let's take a look at the example. This is basically the, the problem we were talking about originally. We have particles in A and B, both uh, mass M, and the masses of these particles are large enough that the rod masses don't really matter. They're we'll consider massless. And their length, length L, and pivoted is shown. If theta and phi at zero is equal to zero, so basically what that means is, is that at time equals zero, and this big mass is sitting at the top like this, something like that. Theta dot is equal to zero, and phi dot at time equals zero is equal to omega naught. So this top mass is maybe swinging out omega naught. Let's find theta dot equal to, as a function of phi and phi dot as a function of phi. One thing we can do for sure is, since it's in a horizontal plane, we know that the angular momentum about this point O here is going to be conservative. There's actually no um, applied forces on either of these bodies that's external. Remember the external apply, applied forces actually cancel out, and so we don't have to worry about the internal forces, but it's the external forces that aren't, aren't being applied. If we look at the position vectors, so for example, ROA, let's just say that this is, this is a vector ROA out here to this, this point, ROA there, and then ROB, is from point O again out here to this particular point. There's ROB. Then ROA is say, L along the east of our direction. And then ROB, well, really ROB is ROA plus whatever it takes to get from A to B. So that's L along the east of L direction. So L east of L direction. And I just define this because for the time being, we don't know what that is, but we'll figure it out later. And I guess later is right now, because E sub L is equal to minus cosine phi E sub R plus sine phi E sub theta. And if you don't believe me, then try and see what happens when phi is nearly equal to zero, and that's the thing that goes in here. And then when phi is nearly equal to 90 degrees, and that's what goes in here. Or if you don't like that method, then try Hame-Barrow's method. All right, so in that case, then, R O B is equal to, in terms of E sub R and E sub theta, L times 1 minus cosine phi e sub r plus L sine phi e sub theta. The velocity vectors then is just the time derivative of this. So we go about and, and take the time derivative of each of these terms. And we'll notice that um, for our coordinate system, these coordinates are rotating whenever, are changing direction whenever we change the value of theta. They do not change direction whenever we change the value of psi, or phi. So we don't have to worry about phi in our omega of a coordinate system, but we do have to worry about theta. And it turns out if you look at your E sub R direction for your, uh, for your thumb, right, and then E sub theta direction for your uh, first finger, and then, right, then your middle finger will point straight up, and E sub Z turns out to be straight up. So when you increase theta, when you increase theta, then your, your fingers on your right hand go um, around this O axis, like so. And so that means that your omega CS is around that direction, so it's theta dot E sub Z. <coughs> Excuse me. So in this case, then E sub R dot, because we're going to have an E sub R dot from up here, aren't we? An E sub theta dot, for that matter. E sub R dot is equal to th uh, theta dot. E sub z cross e sub, e sub r, and that turns out to be e sub theta. And then as well, we'd have uh, e sub theta dot is equal to uh, e sub z cross e sub theta, and that's going to be minus e sub r. So here we have then the, the time derivative of r o a. Well, that's going to be l, and l is a constant, so it's l theta dot e sub theta because we have e sub r dot, don't we? And the theta dot comes from the omega term. So r dot OA is equal to L theta dot E sub theta. And then r dot OB, well, that's a time derivative of this whole mass. That's phi dot L sine phi E sub R plus L times quantity 1 minus cosine phi theta dot 
e sub theta plus L phi dot cosine phi e sub theta minus L sine th phi theta dot e sub r. And if you don't believe me here, then just try it out. Try the derivative for yourself. So if we regroup on e sub r and e sub theta, then this is what we end up with. And there's some simplification that can be done here. Notice that we have phi dot minus theta dot, and that doesn't arise by accident. That actually makes some sense. Uh, might do a, look, a little bit of looking at that to see if you believe it or not. And as well on the sine side, uh, we see this same sort of thing, uh, phi dot minus theta dot. Again, that doesn't arise by accident. Okay, so since momentum is conserved about O, and O is a fixed point, then our, the sum of the applied moments on all of the bodies is equal to the total angular momentum of all of the bodies about that same point, um, a time derivative of that, I should say. Um, they should be equal to each other. So then, since the applied moments are, sum of the applied moments is equal to zero, then the time derivative of the angular momentum about that same point is equal to zero. And then, so then this angular momentum has to be equal to a constant. So let's look at the total angular momentum for the whole system about O. It turns out that that's ROI, where like ROA and ROB, for example, cross with M sub I, M sub A and M sub B, that is, um, R sub I dot. This is the linear momentum, isn't it? So we have R sub OA, MA, R sub OA dot, and we have R sub OB cross MB, R sub OB dot. And both the masses are the same, they're both M, so we've written them out here as just M. So ROA cross MR dot OA plus ROB cross MR dot OB. Now ROA cross MR dot OA is equal to L E sub R, that's our moment arm, crossed with ML theta dot E theta, that's the time derivative, we, did, we just found that term. And so what we end up with is ML squared theta dot. That's for this first term in our angular momentum equation. The second one, well, I wish it were easier, but it's not. ROB is this, this quantity here, L times the quantity 1 minus cosine phi times E sub R, hat plus L sine theta, L sine phi, I should say, E sub theta. And that's cross product with this rather long term, right? And that's our M, here's our M. R dot sub OB, L sine phi times the quantity phi dot minus theta dot E sub R plus L times the quantity theta dot plus cosine phi times the quantity phi dot minus theta dot in the E sub theta direction. And if we simplify all of this out, eventually what we end up with is that you'll notice that we have E sub R cross E sub R, that term cancels out. E sub theta cross E sub theta, that term cancels out. But E sub R E sub r cross E sub theta, that doesn't cancel out, and neither does E sub theta cross E sub r. Turns out that both of these end up giving us an E sub z term, and so we end up with ML squared times the quantity 2 minus 2 cosine phi times theta dot plus the quantity cosine phi minus 1 times phi dot. So if this is a constant, then this all has to be always a constant. So at t equals zero, then we said, right from the initial conditions, at t equals zero, phi, uh, theta dot's equal to zero, theta is equal to phi is equal to zero, and so then h about O at zero is equal, is equal to zero at all times. So we can substitute all those quantities in, right, and we get with theta dot is equal to three minus two cosine phi, right, because you notice we've got another theta dot over here, plus phi dot times the quantity cosine phi minus 1 is equal to 0. And if we regroup, we can see we've got theta dot over here in terms of phi dot and phi. And so then theta dot, theta dot is equal to phi dot multiplied against 1 minus cosine phi divided by 3 minus 2 cosine phi. That tells us what theta dot is in terms of, of phi and phi dot. But that isn't what we were asked to find, was it? If we go back a couple of pages, and we can see now that what we were really looking for was, is we were looking to find theta dot in terms of phi and phi dot in terms of phi. We're not done yet, unfortunately. Notice that energy is also conserved. So we use conservation of 
angular momentum. Turns out that linear momentum isn't conserved because it's going about a, on a curved path. But the other thing we can worry about is energy. How is energy doing? And it turns out that there's no uh, losses of energy. So if we know the energy at the initial point, we know the energy is at the final point, and we can figure out what's going on. Turns out that in this system, there are no springs, there's no mass to worry about, there's no storage of potential energy. So we don't have any potential energy whatsoever to worry about. So that's actually rather convenient because all we have to worry about is kinetic energies. The kinetic energy is always a constant. So the kinetic energy then um, is, is is given here. We have the, the first mass, the mass A, if you like, VA, VA, and then mass B, mass 2, mass B, V, B, V, B, V, B there. All right, and theta dot is 0 is equal to 0. So our, the mass that's hanging down at the bottom here, this mass has no, has no kinetic energy at T equals 0. Okay, and this is mass A, isn't it? So then all we have to worry about is this mass here, which happens to be swinging out at omega naught. Phi dot at time equals 0 is equal to omega naught. So then V2 is equal to ROB dot, and that's equal to 0 ER plus L times all of this. We eventually end up with L omega naught E sub theta along the E sub theta direction. Sort of makes sense because it's swinging out about this fixed point. This is L, and the angular velocity is omega naught. So it stands to reason that our velocity then would be equal to L omega naught E sub theta. So our kinetic energy then is one half M2, or, or just M as it turns out here, V2 dot V2 or VB dot VB, whichever one you'd prefer. And that turns out to be this L, each of these turns out to be L omega naught E sub theta hat. Okay, so what we end up with is you dot product a vector by itself, you end up with L squared omega naught squared, and you have the one half in front. This is our kinetic energy initially. It's always the same value, no matter what. So the kin final kinetic energy is the same deal, um, except we have to write it out in terms of the entire expression. We have, because we don't know what it is just in general. R sub OA dot with R dot sub OA dot with R dot sub OA plus one half M times R dot sub OB dotted with R dot sub OB. And we know what this first term is from above, but the second one is not quite so easy to handle. Um, this should be with a square down here. It's a little difficult to see. And in fact, if you expand this out, uh, these two squares out, we can actually can collect on terms a fair amount, and we see that we've got a few um, extra terms in here and there. And if we do the rest of the algebra, we end up with our total kinetic energy at the final time is one half ml squared times the quantity three theta dot squared plus phi dot squared minus two phi dot theta dot plus two theta dot phi dot cosine phi minus two theta dot squared cosine phi. You should really try doing this yourself because 90% of the time that people screw up on this, these kinds of problems, they do it in trying to derive the kinetic energies this way. So try doing this yourself, writing it out, and see if you get what, what I get. And don't necessarily believe the stuff that I've written down here. Okay, so we said that the initial kinetic energy and the final kinetic energies are the same, so we just set them equal to each other. And so this is the initial kinetic energy, and then all this, this long mass is just straight from above, the final kinetic energy. And the masses cancel out, and for that matter, so the one-halves. And so we have everything written in terms of omega naught, and then we have uh, theta dot, phi dot, and then we have phi as well in there. And we have omega naught then, and if we put this equation that we had already, so I'll go back a page or two here. We put this equation in. We know what we know what um, theta dot is in terms of phi dot and phi. So if we substitute in, wherever we have in this equation, we have theta dot. Right? There's theta dot squared. There's theta dot. And we can put in here for phi dot uh, times staff, you know, this, whatever we had there, 
of, of, in terms of phi. And we can do the same sort of thing there. So if we do that, then we get omega naught squared is equal to phi dot squared times all of this stuff here, plus phi dot squared minus 2 phi dot squared times the quantity 1 minus cosine phi squared divided by 3 minus 2 cosine phi. And if we rearrange a bit, we end up with just having a phi dot squared over here on the right-hand side. And it turns out you can simplify what's written here in this equation as 2 minus cosine squared phi divided by 3 minus uh, 2 cosine phi. And if we put this over with omega not squared on the other side and take the square root of both sides, we can turns out we can find phi dot in terms of just omega naught, which is a constant, and then phi. Remember what we were looking for. We were looking for phi dot in terms of phi. And then once we have that, then we can substitute in for our equation for theta dot and get theta dot in terms of phi, which is the other thing we were looking for. And you look at this equation and you look at the, uh, the equation for the arm, and I hope you realize to yourself that, that you know, there'd be no way to really try to work this out unless you had thought it through carefully in this way. This completes some more traditional methods of modeling dynamic systems. So this is the last that you're going to see, at least with this course, uh, until we get back to the, you know, preparing for the exam. I'm talking about using Newton's second law and so forth. From now on, we're going to use analytical methods as, which make use of system energies much more than we've seen so far. Um, and what that means is Lagrange's equations, Hamilton's equations, and so forth. The derivations are complicated, but the usage is, is actually much easier. Um, one, one thing to keep in mind is there are no more free body diagrams. Okay, and that's really a nice thing to get rid of. And furthermore, no more R double dot. Okay, we don't have to worry about finding accelerations anymore. All we need are the velocities. So I hope that entertains you enough to, to make you hang on until we get to that point. And uh, that's the end of lecture number five. Thank you.